Okay, good evening everybody. Tonight's subject is what's wrong with the movies? Um, this is a question I think that gets asked more and more. Probably, why can't we watch movies, Rabbi? What's wrong with movies? I mean, there are clean movies, aren't there, Rabbi? I mean, what's wrong with movies? So I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of movies, first of all. It's an interesting thing because at the, um, at the beginning of the era of movies, the movie started basically as a penny arcade entertainment. People were fascinated to go walk into a storefront shop and the lights would go down and they see these horses jumping out of walls. <clears throat> it was fascinating. Nobody thought that film was a language. Now, this is so axiomatic as, to us today that film is a language that you can communicate ideas and feelings, but that's something which was not thought of at all. Film was understood, film, cinema, movies. <clears throat> was, I say, a penny arcade entertainment. The mere thrill of seeing the process was not enough in itself to, um, to bring people in, but obviously there's a, there's a limit to that. I mean, even though I guess nowadays we'll, you can see that, uh, I remember when IMAX first came out and back in the day, Cinerama, you've never heard of Cinerama, right? Cinerama was like, it was like three screens and of course there was, it wasn't that good because you could see the gap between the, the three screens, I think. I think uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey was, uh, I remember seeing that in Cinerama and sitting in, in the front seat and like, you know, doing like, the cinema always relied to a certain extent on spectacle, but a, a language? How did that start? So the language of film started with a movie by Arthur Melbourne Cooper in 1900, and it was called Grandma's Reading Glass. I doubt anybody who was sitting in the <coughs> audience of that movie realized they were watching the birth of a language. Grandma's Reading Glass <coughs> is a, under a minute in length. It has a very thin plot. Basically, a small child picks up his grandmother's magnifying glass, <coughs> excuse me, and he walks around the room looking at various objects through this looking glass. What makes the film notable, what makes it a breakthrough, revolutionary, was the use of what's called sustained point-of-view shots, meaning it's something that we take for granted, so let, let me explain what it means. You, you'll have like a shot of the child picking up the magnifying glass, and then the child will put the magnifying glass to its eye. Now what happened was, then the camera shows you what he's looking at. That's something that's like so obvious now that you don't even think about it. But in, back in the day, it was just you'd have a camera. You wouldn't, the idea of a point of view, POV, shot was something revolutionary. And that was the beginning of what we call the syntax of film. The ability to tell a story. And little more than, I guess, you know, 120, 30 years later, Films have become so ubiquitous that reading books have become a niche industry. <coughs> I don't have up-to-date figures, but when I checked this out, a 2004 National Endowment for the Arts survey showed that fewer than half of American adults read literature. Of course, film's great attraction is its ability to endomashmir luria. Seeing something, seeing is believing. And although we may not exactly believe what our eyes tell us, it's more easy than in any other medium to achieve what's, what Samuel Taylor Coleridge called was the 
willing suspension of disbelief, which constitutes dramatic art. It's much more difficult in the theater to get people to suspend their disbelief. Nowadays, a person's disbelief has very little need to be suspended because the amount of money that they spend on, on sp special effects in movies nowadays, you know, probably uh, dwarfs the uh, gross national, national product of Peru last year. I mean, it's just people, the incredible amount of money, incredibly <coughs> accurate special effects. And I remember my kids, when I was, I think, about 18 or 19, I read Lord of the Rings. And uh, it was one of my favorite books as a kid. It was something, Tolkien does something very clever in that book. Because he starts off with um, a little world, and you think that's all there is. And then suddenly he does the equivalent in prose, in writing, of doing this sort of monumental, huge drone shot where he pulls back and you realize that this, the tiny little shire is just this tiny little corner of this enormous canvas of his third, what's it called, middle world events. A brilliant way of writing. And you know, and then of course my kids said, oh daddy, you have to see the film, you have to see the film. And it was so disappointing because the world's best special effects unit is the human brain. There is nothing like your imagination. And what movies have done, one of the things that I would suggest, is actually limit our imagination. To the extent that things are spelled out, you don't need to imagine them. And you'll see why I'm talking about this. I'll come back to that. In fact, I remember as a child, there was this uh, you know, BBC radio um, program. I was a pretty young kid, I guess, and I remember hiding under the covers at night so my parents wouldn't realize I was listening to the radio. And we didn't have TV back then, or if we did, it was like, you know, not really. Uh... Radio was the thing, and they had this thing called Journey into Space. I remember they used to Journey into Space. This is sort of big echo on the end. And it was, um, it was actually quite clever, but I remember that what was going on in my head, the special effects, you know, like no science fiction film will ever be able to recreate the human imagination. And I told them I was very, 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 very disappointed. I said, okay, Daddy, well, you have to see Harry Potter. Now, I'd never read Harry Potter. So they showed me Harry Potter. And I went, okay, you know, okay, it's, it's cute. Some good acting and clever ideas. And then I remember we were, on holiday, we were on holiday, and I went to Daven the following morning. And I got into Shmona Esrei, and I went, Baruch Ato Hashem. I looked up the window, and there was this Ford Anglia traveling across the sky. And I realized that inside my brain was the, this had been planted this image. Kodesh Baruch Hu gives us the koyach of dimion, of imagination. And that's a very, very important power that a person has. Because a person has to imagine, he has to depict in front of himself the realities that the eye doesn't see. He has to picture. I'm standing in front of the master of the universe. I have to, I'm not saying a person has to have a picture in his head, but the koyach ad dimion, the, about, the, the power to to conjure up, to make something visceral, which is intellectual, is, is, a, is a, a necessary gift in our Avodah Hashem. And I realized that that power had been hijacked by Harry Potter's Ford Anglia. And I thought, this is a very dangerous thing. Now, Harry Potter, I guess, is a, you know, nowadays you have movies. And we'll come back to The Lion King and these other films which turn animals into human beings, which is also a very frightening thing. Uh, there's a story that goes that during the Second World War, the German Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals sent a urgent telegram to the um, Nazi party, to the, uh, what's it called, to the SS, that um, could they please stop the 
they could, they, they could please sort of uh, wind down, they could slow down the deportation of Jews to the death camps because they were finding it difficult to find foster homes for the animals that were left behind. To me, it's a very dangerous thing when you take an animal and you make him talk and you make him almost more human than a human. Maybe we'll talk about that a bit later. Let's go back to movies. So here we are in an era where movies have taken over and movies are extremely powerful. Ein Domalaria Lishmia, and they've hijacked our ability, our koyach and dimian, which is a very dangerous thing, I think. Of course, I'm talking about films which are not reprehensible in any way, which may even be considered to be positive, which may even have a, a Musa value. I remember many years ago, somebody to told me that, no, movies are a very positive, uh, how do you say, uh, can have a very positive effect, and they quoted to me a film called uh, Schindler's List, and uh, how this was, you know, exposed the Nazis, and, and, and I pointed out to this person that all our concepts <coughs> of drama, which is basically what film is, are, come from the Greeks. The whole concept of drama, of what it's a Greek idea, and in point of fact it was part of the Greeks' worship. Now this is probably a subject more to be discussed at Hanukkah than now, but the drama was a... All the words we have to do with, with, with our Greek words, tragedia, comedia, and there's a world that is, was part of the concept of Greek drama, which found its way into psychology, psychiatry, which is catharsis. Catharsis is a Greek word. Catharsis, as the, Greek under, the Greeks understood it, was by allowing the, to play out these powerful uh, images, powerful scenes, distressing scenes, tragic scenes, that in some way this would expunge from a person's psyche the, it would give him some kind of release. Of course, psycho, psychotherapy, psychoanalysis, I think it was Freud. I'm not sure, I'm not a, a special, I, don't, I haven't studied psychology that much. But I think it was Freud who said that the whole idea of getting somebody to talk, to psychoanalyze them, was to, to uh, bring to the surface these powerful emotions and to render them harmless. For example, one of the classic Greek dramas, tragedies, is Oedipus Rex, the story of Oedipus. Again, Oedipus was another character who was hijacked by psychology. Oedipus is a tragedy about a son who is cursed to kill his father and marry his mother. One of the most tragic possible plots you can imagine. The idea the Greeks had that by experiencing this, these emotions in a controlled environment, this would, so to speak, like release the steam from the pressure cooker. So I argued to him, I said, no, what movies do is a person actually feels he paid his dues. Movies do the opposite of goad you into action. Movies actually make you feel, yeah, I was there. <laughs> I did it. I'm okay. I don't need to do anything else. It's, to me, I, I could be wrong, but I would love to somebody to prove to me that anybody did anything as a result of see, seeing a movie. I don't know. Maybe, maybe please contradict me. If, uh, it seems to me that if the Greeks were right and our drama comes from them, that this whole idea, by the way, parenthetically, of bringing powerful emotions to the surface, uh, we're going on a tangent, tangent here, is why the idea of teaching people Kabbalah, a big now thing on the internet, right? Internet Kabbalah is so ridiculous, if not dangerous. The deeper wisdom of the Kabbalah is called the Torah's Halev, the Torah of the heart. And Kabbalah is transmitted in seemingly anodyne riddles, stories that you're not quite sure you understood it. You'll read them a forish and you'll suddenly, suddenly he'll get to the end of the line of explaining something in some kind of strange terminology and he'll say, Hamevin Yovin, 
the one who understands will understand. And you realize you've just read something which is Kabbalistic. You can't teach, teach somebody Kabbalah in the terms of intellectually teach them. You can expose them to the... And then according to the purity of their heart, they will be able to internalize because it's the Torah's Halev. When you bring the Torah's Halev up into the world of the intellect, you have essentially, it's no longer, it's no longer Kabbalah, it becomes Gemara, it becomes something which the mind is now dealing with. It's lost its sting. It's very much analogous to, there's a posuk, I think it's in Mishle, that says, Daga Belev Ish Yashchenu La'acherim. One of the droshes of that is, Daga Belev Ish Yashchenu La'acherim. Daga Belev Ish. A worry in the heart of a person. Yashchenu La'acherim. He should say it, Sicha. He should speak it over. Speak it to other people. A person has a worry in his heart, he should speak to other people, he should tell other people about the worry. Why? Because the daga believe ish, something which is in the heart, has a tremendous power. To the extent, why is it so far powerful? Because it's unexpressed, it's unverbalized. As soon as you bring it up to the level of the moach of the brain, <coughs> it loses its power for bad if it's a worry, or for good if it's a deep part of Jewish wisdom. It took psychologists a couple of, I don't know how many hundreds of years, a thousand years, to figure out that, and this is the basis of a lot of um, psychology, to get people to talk. Anyway, that's parenthetical. We're really talking now about the idea of the drama and how drama is not, a, in my opinion, does not lead a person to action. It's not positive in that way. Well, that's my point. Let me just, because the, the, for the microphone, so what, please tell me your name again. Ruin Svi. Ruin Svi just pointed out that he actually disagrees with me and he's been to a movie and he's seen a great life of somebody which, has, which inspired him to want to emulate that life. Yeah. But did you actually do something about it? No. No. So that was, that's my point, that it leaves a person feeling, feeling something, but... It's, 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 um, empty what do you, what do you say? Empty it's an, em, it's an, it's a, it's, that's what I'm saying. It's a kind of a, um, it's, it's a, it's a catharsis. The whole idea of catharsis is to expunge that feeling, not to kind of take that feeling and, and, and you can't bear living with it until you act on it. Action comes from a person, person's restlessness, restlessness in, in a sense. I, I can't go on until I do something about this. I'm saying that my, my feeling is that films, based on the fact that it comes from the Greeks and the whole concept comes from this idea of catharsis, is it does just the opposite of goad a person into action. It actually leaves a, people, a person maybe feeling inspired in some vague way, but it doesn't have that component of not letting you rest until you trans, transfer that, that, that emotion, that feeling, into action. There's another thing which I think probably is um, about the film, about movies, about the language of film, syntax of film that we're talking about now. George Bluestone in his book in 1957, um, I think it's, I don't remember the exact title, something like Turning Novels into Movies. He points out a very interesting thing that Film, again, we've accepted the premise that film is a language. It's a way of telling a story. It's narrative. Film, however, unlike a novel, has only one tense, the present tense. Everything in a film takes place in a constant stream of now. And film is very kind of awkward 
clumsy when it comes to want to do, go into the past tense or the future tense, right? How do you do that in a film? Yes, it seems like only yesterday, but it must be 25 years ago, go, go, right? The, the echo comes up and, the, and then, you know, so, and then what we can't, but we're still, now we're back in the present. There's no was in film. There's no will be. Everything takes place in a constant present tense. Now, I was thinking to myself, what, is that, what does that really mean? What does that... A person can relate. Let's do it from another angle. The word in Hebrew for time is Zman. Now Zman is connected, and to the best of my knowledge, this is not true in any other language that I'm familiar with. It also has a connotation. The word Zman is also the root of another, is a word Hazmana. Hazmana, as the way the Gemara uses it, is, means to prepare, a preparation. In modern Hebrew, the word Hazmana is an invitation. Somebody wants to invite somebody to a wedding, you send them a hazmana. The Gemara talks about hazmana milsahi or hazmana lo milsahi. Does the preparation of something affect the change in its status halachically? What is, if you think about it, what is the connection between the word time and invitation? And the answer is, it's a deep idea. Time seems to us like this megalithic existence which has always been here and always will, will be here. That is the way Zman looks. We're born into the world and we leave the world. And it seems as though we kind of travel through this thing which, is, which has always been here. A monolithic edifice, which is always, that is the root of all kfira, the root of all atheism, is the concept that time has already been here, has always been here, excuse me. If time always exists, there is no room for a creation. And if there's no room for a creation, there's no, re re word, there's no room for a creator. The very first word in the Torah, Bereshis, is that Hashem bara reishis, according to the Vilna Gaon and others, Hashem created reishis. Hashem created beginning. You can look at this world in two very different ways. You can look at this world, as, as I said before, this monolithic block of existence, time just is, or you can look at Zman as a Hazmana, as an invitation. I, I, like, to, I like to say that, that Judaism is about turning the present into the future before it becomes the past. Every second is a Hazmana. Every split second of time is a, an invitation to create something which is eternal. If you think about it, you read the um, eulogies in the New York Times about somebody who's famous and did all this stuff. You know, he went to the South Pole and he flew around the world and he went up in a space rocket or whatever rich people do nowadays who are too bored to do anything useful with their money. And if you think about it, if you look at life as a series of the events in your life, so really, I mean, because every, every, every experience happens, then it dies. It's gone. And then the next thing comes, and it's gone. And it's gone. And you did that. You paraglided off the top of Everest. What it is, it's gone. It's gone. It's gone. So if you, ca if you characterize your life as a series of the events in your life, then basically what your life consists of is a moment, is, is a series of deaths, because each moment is dying, each experience is dying, is dying, is dying, is dying. And then at the end, there's the big death. So 
Maybe that's why people love crazy things like bungee jumping. Because there's something beyond the experiences of life itself. Sorry, something beyond life's experiences, which is the perception of life itself. Life itself. The Gemara says that the world will be 6,000 years and 1,000 chorev. It'll, the world, it'll be a yom, it's a yom shakula Shabbos. It'll be a world of complete Shabbos, a world of existence without events, a world where our perception will be of life itself. What is the perception of life itself? As we said, that's why people want to do bungee jumping. Imagine Chas Khalili in front of a fa- firing squad. And they say, take aim. And they bring out their guns. Imagine what you feel at that moment. And then suddenly, somebody runs and the prisoner's free. What do you feel at that second? Life itself. That will be what the seventh millennia will be like. The perception of life itself. And that is what you can experience on Shabbos, the 160th of Olam Haba. It's interesting, the Rambam says that if you think about it, the corollary, well, he doesn't say, he says the last, but if you think about it, the corollary of Olam Hazer, Olam Hazer means this world. What is the corollary of Olam Hazer? Olam Ha, who? Not Olam Haba. Olam Ha, who? Why is it Olam Haba? Because this, the world to come, is nothing more than the world that you comes as a result of taking every single second of Zman and turning that into something which is future. You're invited. Time itself is an invitation to create something eternal. It's a hazmana. It's a preparation. Every single second is a preparation. <coughs> Rav Desla, Zegzad Levrocha, interesting enough, he coined... Uh, a, um, a mashal based on film. It's probably still true in terms of uh, electrons flashing across the screen, but back in the day when... You've actually, have, you, have you ever seen a film? Have you ever seen a, a, what it looks like, movie film? So the whole... Um, how do you say? The whole uh, technology of film is based on a, an anomaly of human vision which is called the persistence of vision, persistence of vision. Persistence of vision is an anomaly in whether it's the eye or the brain, discussions about that. But basically what happens if, if you present to the human brain a series of still images in a very quick succession, something around one sixteenth of a second, or of course it looks a bit jerky like that. Nowadays, cine films are, are usually one twenty-fifth of a second, but basically all of a movie is basically single frames. Rav Dessel used this to illustrate Rav Chaim Mevelozhin's Joshua when it says that the Kodesh Baruch Hu's Mechadish Bechol Yom Tomid Maase Bereshis. That Hashem continually recreates constantly the action of creation. So the question is, is, is Mechadish Bechol Yom Tomid? Why Bechol Yom and Tomid? It's redundant. The answer is that Nefesh Chaim says that every single split second is a separate creation. Kodesh Baruch Hu is recreating the world every single second. We don't see it. And the Moshal Rav Desla brings us the Moshal of a cine film. If you unwind a cine film, it's just one single split second. Kodesh Baruch Hu is creating every single second, and every single second is a second in Zman, and every single second is a Hazmana, is an invitation. Take that second and turn it from the present into the future, because why? In a second, it's going to become the past. So you mean by taking the present moment and using it constructively to create your olam haba, being as an invitation to... It's an invitation to something in the future, which is your olam haba, exactly. To take every single second that you've been given, every frame of your life, and understand this is an... Hasmana. This is a, an invitation. I'm being invited to something called Olam Haba. And accepting that invitation. And when a person does a mitzvah, when a person smiles, 
When a person does a kindness, he's basically accepted that hasbana, he's accepted that invitation. I'd like to finish with a, a story, a mashal that I heard from Ramosh Shapiro, Zechazad Levrocha. There was a Jew who was traveling in Europe and he came to a, uh, a boarding house and he walked into the boarding house to try and get a room for the night. And um, there was something un unnerving about the, this, you know, he comes, walks up to the desk and he bangs the bell and he's standing there waiting for the, 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 the what's it called, the hotel keeper to come out and he's standing there. Something that's, can't, can't, you know, couldn't place this, something strange here. And then he realizes, the clock, the clock on the wall. And he says to the, the, the hotel keeper, that's my Rebbe's clock. That's my Rebbe's clock. And the storekeeper says, you're right. There was a Jew who came here a few months ago and he couldn't pay for the, the bill, so he gave me his clock instead. He said, but how did you know that that was your Rebbe's clock? So the Talmud said, every other clock in the world goes like this. Tick, one step closer to death. Tock, another step closer to death. Tick, another step towards the end of existence. Tock, another day gone. Tick, my Rebbe's clock goes like this. Tick, one step closer to Mashiach. Tock, one moment closer to Olam Haba. Tick, closer to Mashiach. Tock, closer to Olam Haba. That's my Rebbe's clock. My Rebbe's clock is not like any other clock in the world. We're sitting now a week before Rosh Hashanah. And you know, it's difficult sometimes because what well, life kind of goes on, but life doesn't go on. Life has a very definite end. And every single second that we're being given is a hasmana, it's zman. When the Kodesh Baruch Hu took Klal Yisrael out of Mitzrayim, the first mitzvah they were given was what? Kiddush HaKodesh. What, what, you know, if you were thinking, that's like a really, yeah? Why, why the sanctification of the moon? And the answer is that Kiddush HaKodesh was an entirely way, different way of looking at time. This is what we're talking about now. That was basically what the mitzvah was about. Kodesh Baruch when he took us out of Mitzrayim, he didn't just take us out of Egypt, he took us out of a world where nothing exists except the present. That was the Eshes Zanunim, that was Mitzrayim, that was the go with the flow mentality. Water goes with the flow, water has no shape, water fills any vessel you put it into. Water, Mayim is a plural noun, it has no singularity, it has no direction. It's the essence of go with the flow of immorality. It rejects tzura. It rejects the ashes chayil. We live in that world. The world of the movies. And I'm not just talking about, you know, as we said at the beginning, it's becoming more and more of a fact of life. It's, it's a clean movie. It's a kosher movie. I have to understand that the whole language of movies, the syntax, syntax of movies, is based on the, the Weltanschung, the world view of what was Egypt. Now this, now this, now this. It also hijacks our koyach hadimian and it saps the wellsprings of action. It's difficult to talk against movies, but Maybe I'll end with a joke. One of the things I'm going to have to do tshuva for 
is as a kid I used to love science fiction movies. You know, the old, bad old ones in the black and white. So one of them that I uh, really liked was this thing called Invasion of the Body Snatchers. I think they probably made, remade it a few times, but the original one was virtually really quite, I'm going to say quite good. Basically, the premise was that these aliens who'd been traveling around in pods across the vast, trackless galaxies of the universe make, make a landing somewhere, where else but of Southern California, and what happens is these pods, when people come into contact with them, they fall asleep and they wake up and they're not the, the people anymore. They've been invaded by this alien life force, this heartless, cruel alien. And of course, you know, when you're sitting at the, the breakfast table and you're, you're looking at your husband and suddenly you realize that's not your husband anymore. It's this heartless, cruel, ruthless alien. When I, when I told this, about this film to my wife, she understood exactly what I was talking about. But um, they're very powerful. Movies are very powerful. The language of movies are very powerful. But there's a price to be paid. And you know, we're like everything in life, one has to understand what that price is. We have a Torah, we have Hashem's Torah, we have something which is sublime, which is above time. And when we connect to that, then that's really life itself. Kodesh Baruch Hu should seal us all, should write us all, seal us all in the, in the book of life for a good Gebenstia.